back on uh, the show right now. So let's just restart this whole discussion, shall we? Okay. You bet. All right. Steve Kraft, you're joining me as well. Do you have any questions for Donald Harris, head of the NAACP here in Maricopa County? Well, um, a lot of people might think that it's somehow strange that a white man should lead the NAACP's local chapter, but I guess your point of view is that uh, really should it's really not relevant to the to task and the mission of the NAACP. Who leads it? It, it really isn't. Uh, you're either involved in civil rights, no matter what your color mm -hmm. is, or well, you're not involved. And uh, people forget the NAACP was founded, and two of the founding fathers, if you will, were white Jews. That's Back 105 years ago. People ought to read a little history about the NAACP. There was a lot of uh, Caucasian uh, hand in this forming of the NAACP. And why historically have there been so many Jewish people who have been at the forefront of the civil rights movement? Well, the Jewish people, you know, have their little attacks to grind with the world about the way the Jews have been treated. And I won't get into that because it's a totally separate issue. But uh, Jews have uh, felt the angst and the pains of uh, being stepped upon, had the boot on their throat, so to speak. So I think it's a natural uh, place for them to go to help others who are downtrodden. And I, that's why I think you see a lot of uh, members of the Jewish community who actually work in civil rights and support civil rights. All right, so we're already getting questions from our viewers in the chat, and they want to get your take. Do you believe that Rachel Dolezal, you know, the woman who's gotten all of this attention recently, do you believe that there's such a thing as transracial? I'm going to tell you right up front, like you've been asked, sir. Just look up in the dictionary the word transracial. There is no such word. Seven days ago, no one ever heard of that word. This is a word that was created within the last seven days. There's no transracial. There's, you got the Trans Siberian Railroad, you got trans fats, you don't have transracial. You don't become black today, switch back to white tomorrow, and black the next day. That's transracial. It don't exist. So what's your take on her? Do you think that she's sort of an embarrassment to the NAACP, or do you think she's done an outstanding job and we shouldn't be fussing about it? Uh, number one, yes. She's <laughs> turned into an embarrassment. It started out where, you know, you have a little bit of... Uh, empathy like well she's been a good work she's done this she's done that she is now being investigated as of this morning in spokane for uh different charges of harassment and conflicts of interest uh are you aware of that what uh the investigation of uh, dolezal no i'm not yeah they uh, there's an investigation she may possibly be charged with criminal tra charges and that stems out of the fact she was appointed because she was African American as an ombudsman for the police department. Right. But in that capacity, she also had been attacking the police and the police officers on behalf of representing different African Americans up in the Spokane area and had privy and information that she shouldn't have had and shouldn't have used as an ombudsman for the police department. And one week ago when this came out, I said, this woman it's just like the thread on a piece of material. You start pulling it, and the whole suit is going to get unraveled. And that's what's happening now. She's becoming undone. And that's an embarrassment. It's kind of amazing how big this story has become over the course of the last week. And really, I think it just comes down to the fact that she lied about everything. It was a fraud. Because some people were confused. Some people thought that people were getting upset because someone that was an African-American was leading this NAACP chapter, but it's not about that. No. It's about the fraud. That's right. It's, it's, whatever she did boils down to being fraudulent, dishonest, lack of integrity. She's uh, making some, but once again, I think this young lady, uh, with all due respect, I think she has problems. I think she has emotional, mental problems. What do you make of the fact that she was raised with four adopted African-American siblings, and whether that might have sort of affected her view of her own racial identity. Number one, it speaks well of her mother and father. Let's put that in proper perspective. They're the ones that adopted the children and raised them. So from that aspect, her parents did a great thing by doing that. 
Number two, yes, she would have some sort of an identity with them if she was close to them, and I assume they had a close family life. Uh, I don't think I'd like to be at their Christmas table this next year. <laughs> but uh, uh, she, she must have had something. Of course, you couldn't live in a household and be, share the brother-sister experience as not, you know, feel something about the uh, uh, some empathy toward your family, your, your, your adopted children. But then, once again, isn't it true that when those children were adopted, they were also taken out of the African-American community and they were raised probably in a Caucasian community. True, so maybe maybe uh, everybody sort of meets in the middle. <laughs> I don't think that stuff is like, you know, well, it's 50% of this today and 50% of that tomorrow, so we'll meet in the middle. I, you know, you have an experience. I don't think you can quantify it. You can't say, well, now she's got 50% of black experience because she had three or four uh, siblings who were adopted uh, who are uh, African Americans. I yes. think it would give maybe some some little bit of an understanding. But once again, how much of that African American experience came with those kids? Right. We're getting a lot of questions actually from our viewers as well, Donald. Uh, so I'm going to read a couple of them. Uh, Rachel is asking, "What's your opinion on what could happen to her?" Well, number one, if she has violated the law, then she ought to be prosecuted. If she is mentally ill, then she ought to be treated. Uh, you know, we have a defense in the criminal law that if you're incapacitated to a certain degree and you can't form a criminal intent, then you don't get tried. Or if that was such in your mental state at the time you did it, perhaps you didn't have the mens rea, the uh, necessary the intent. Uh, evil intent, exactly. Yeah. And... Uh, that's what we're going to find out. But I, I, I think she has, you know, she has some problems. I got to um, ask you: Are you the only uh, white uh, leader of an NAACP chapter, or are there a number of white leaders of chapters? I don't know. I've never asked that question. <laughs> it never. It, it, it wasn't something that ever came up. Like, you know, gee, am I the only one? You know, am I going to get a prize for being a uh, white man of the year or something? Uh, that never mm -hmm. came up to me. And. Um, Obviously, uh, for at least two or three days, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I, I may very well be the only one now again. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you the, Let me ask you a question. I'm kind of getting at it. Who cares if Who she's cares? white or black? Exactly. Well, whatever. that's what I'm saying. No one cares about the white or black difference. It's all about the deception here. I think. So what is the deception? That was the outrage. If, if it doesn't matter, what is the deception? Is it like some big law that she's broken that she says she was one thing when she really wasn't? I just want to trust my leader, whoever my leader is. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's not sweep this under the table. If, if she received a scholarship, and I don't know all the facts yet on that, if she received a scholarship to Howard University predicated on the fact she was African American, that's fraud. If you assume that she got that scholarship as an African American, and then several years later, she sues Howard University as a white person because they wouldn't give her a scholarship as a white person to get a master's degree. That does not speak very well for her integrity. Fair. I mean, would you have to agree with me on that? Yeah, I could see that, sure. We got a couple more questions. Deborah's asking, what do you think would have driven her to actually disguise herself as black for all these years? Well, I don't know if to disguise. She, she was down at the tanning booth probably a couple of days a week. Uh, she got her hair frizzy frizzy and um, it made her maybe feel more comfortable. But in exercising that prerogative to make herself look like whatever she wanted to look like, why does she go ahead and take that job, which is clearly you had to be African American, to be an ombudsman to the Spokane Police Department? That's an outright lie. And now it's coming out this morning, or as of about two hours ago, from so trying to follow it, that uh, she may have violated the law in her capacity of being an ombudsman and also representing people from the NAACP for police harassment and uh, crimes of that nature. And so it just gets uglier and uglier. This is a young lady that would have been really well off to keep her mouth shut, resign the first day, because she knows what was going on, she knows what was happening, resign and gotten out of there. My dad used to tell me, when you catch yourself 
digging yourself deeper into a hole. Stop digging. Mm -hmm. She didn't stop digging. Yeah, I mean, then you appear on all the national networks. But then, you know, there's also the other element of it, the internal drama between her and her parents and all of the fallout mm -hmm. there. Like I said, I don't think I want to be at their Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't she, I've read she was estranged from her parents. Is that true? Yeah, I mean... Something that they like hadn't that. been talking in a while and that she refused to let them see her, their grandson. I read something like that. Hmm. Remember, this came about because a reporter came to her mom and dad. Once again, this is hearsay to me, but I understand from my reports. A reporter went to them and said, uh, you know, we're starting to get some words here that uh, your daughter is not black or she is your natural daughter the other children were adopted what's the story is she black or she not and the parents said no she, she was naturally born with a mom and dad and then you know the wolves are off to the races hmm. i have a couple more questions coming from the chat room interesting perspective from a handful of different people uh do you think Dolezal sees herself as a race traitor like so many whiteness studies professors speak of. I'm sorry, I, I missed that. I, I didn't come through clearly. Oh, uh, one of our viewers is asking, do you think that Dolezal sees herself as a race traitor like so many whiteness studies that professors speak of? A traitor? To her race. Uh, come on, no, no. I, I think, and I have no disrespect to the question asked, because the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. Uh, no, I, I, I don't see her as a traitor to her race. What, what has she been a traitor? What is, what has she cost the white race? Has she <laughs> opened up the back door so the Russians can come in and attack the white people in America? No, <laughs> she's not a traitor. Not a traitor. She's a, she, she, she's a misguided, a misguided young lady who may need some psychiatric care. Uh, Chacha Rom has an interesting question. Should we ask for a psychological evaluation before any prosecution begins? I don't think they usually work it that way. Now, she was a danger to herself. The family wanted her committed because she was a danger. You're in a different realm of the law. I don't think she's a danger to herself, not unless this thing now burdens her so much that she becomes suicidal or a threat to her well-being. But uh, you can't just say, go get her examined for what she's done. She may want to have it done if she's got a smart defense lawyer. <laughs> right now, have her down at your local shrink and get yourself a report so that when it comes to that, if it does, you can walk into the police department with a report and say, hey, come on. This lady is now under psychiatric care. She's had the diminished capacity. She's got this, she's got whatever she's got. And start uh, working a way to keep this to a minimal uh, charge. I mean, that's what I would do if I was her lawyer and she came to me for advice. I mean, and you, that's your profession. What about professor? No, 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 sorry. You uh, professionally were a lawyer for decades, right? Gosh, 52 years now. So you have been a, a prosecutor, been a defense lawyer. But the thing is, you know, uh, when you when you win a case as a defense lawyer, because the prosecution usually loses the case, not because of something done. But if you want to be prepared, go in there now. And if you're going to be going with a psychiatric, uh, if in fact she's ever charged, I'm not saying she's going to be charged. I would want that psychiatric report in my hand rickety tick yeah that means quick that means quickly <laughs> <laughs> like what term is that rickety tick <laughs> i haven't heard that one in a while um i guess oh, well, one of the viewers is uh, kind of submitting a follow-up question kind of explaining what they meant by race trader i guess white people who give up their white privilege is what he was asking about give up their white, well, I'm sorry. White privilege, and I noticed a lot of people in social media kind of talk about this. This well, idea of white privilege and her choosing not to be a part of that. I, I, I don't know if this, you know, you're sort of making it like a, a stratified community. If you're this, you have certain privilege. If you're this, you have certain privilege. I noticed one of the people, I was on CNN last night with Don Lemon, 
Mm-hmm. Well, actually, it might have been with, I was on earlier with uh, Anderson Cooper's, Anderson Cooper's segment. Yeah. And we had Angela Davis, Michaela Angela Davis, was on the panel with me. And, you know, very, very bright uh, person. Like, you know, you got to be careful, you can't see bright lady. Very, very bright person. And uh, she came to the same agreement as I did on that aspect of it. Uh, you know, this... Uh, this person's got some problems. She's got problems. And, and today, Don Lemon, Don Lemon said, you know, I want, I want her to be in her corner. I can't anymore. She, she's caused this herself and she's lied, she's cheated, and I can't uh, be in her corner anymore. Remember, when you do some of these things, we all have a little bit of ego in us. Some a great deal, some lesser. And when we do some of the things we do in life, it's because we do get a satisfaction. We do get the strokes. We do get the, hey, thank you so much for helping out in the community. Thank you for getting my son into school. Thank you for getting my kid reinstated in school. Thank you for getting my kid into the school in the white neighborhood when they banned him from coming. You know, and you go home, you feel good. You feel good because you've accomplished something that's good. And it goes hand in hand. And then there's always that little stroke, the ego stuff. Hmm. It just seems that uh, these racial issues have really kind of taken over the headlines over the last year. That's because it's 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 a slow summer. <laughs> I'm looking, but I'm looking back to I'm looking back to Ferguson and well, that's true. Ferguson. Baltimore and uh, New York City and Cleveland and all these different places with uh, police in which. African American people died at the hands of cops, and racial profiling has become a big issue. And you know, just so many issues have bubbled to the surface. It seems to me, and it's become an increasingly large part of our uh, news coverage. And it's depressing because it's 2015. It's not you know 1948 or something like that. And it's just at, at what point does this stuff finally? Do we finally get past these issues, or do we ever? I'm going to give you a compliment. You just hit it right on the head. What you just said, this last uh, two minutes of yours, that is what's going on in this country of ours. You hit it right on the head, sir. We have problems in this country. Segregation is coming back. Civil rights is slip sliding away. Remember that great rock and roll song? Slip sliding away. <laughs> slip sliding away. That's what's happening. It's slip sliding away. We'll tell uh, Paul Simon you do a good version. I'm available for weddings and bar mitzvahs. So, uh, you know, the thing is that uh, we're losing. We're losing. And we have got to put a halt. We've got to dig the heels in. And right now, stop this. We're going in reverse. Civil rights is failing. But why? Because we keep hearing that the, the newer generation coming up is colorblind and kids don't really care. And, and, oh, uh, bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> colorblind. And, uh, there's prejudice out there. It's, uh, it's just terrible. Remember that song from uh, South Pacific? Are you going to sing another song for us? Uh, please no, please. I'm going to talk it. I'm, okay. I, know I don't want to put you through that. I would right. like to, but I won't. Right. Um, You've got to be taught to hate and fear, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. It's a great song. It's out of uh, South Pacific. Mm -hmm. And it's a great song, Rogers and Hart. And uh, mm -hmm. it hits it on the head. And, and that's what kids are learning in the household. I grew up in a household, thank God, it was the opposite. If mm -hmm. God forbid I ever said that bad N word when I was a kid, which I said once, never said it again. My dad jammed my little butt through the couch and said, you're out of this house here. I was five years old. You're going to be thrown out of this house. I said, where am I going to go? <laughs> where, what do you mean he's going to throw me out of the house? He said, it's the filthiest word in the English language. My Don't ever a, use it again. I have a question. That's, What's your take on, I guess, uh, the role that the media plays in terms of people's perception of African Americans and I don't only mean the news media but I mean the mainstream entertainment media for example and the access that maybe people in middle America that don't necessarily interact with African Americans frequently um, how do you think it influences them? I think it's very important culturally white middle-aged people don't wear baseball hats sideways on their head they don't 
don't have dreadlocks. They don't have six rows of gold chains. They don't wear their trousers below their ass. And that doesn't happen. So it's the first thing is they're different than we are. I wasn't brought up once again that way. But I'd be lying to you if I didn't say sometimes I do a double take when somebody's coming down the street like Lou Reed said, do, 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 do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, that guy looks a little different than I look, and it's, it's strange. I understand it because I've been around. Right. I've been around, and I, I've seen it. But uh, you take uh, Joe Blow from Schitt's Creek, Kansas, he hasn't been around it. Right, but I guess I guess what I'm uh, maybe to follow up on my question: How effective is I guess mainstream entertainment, for example, in shaping the public's perception of the African American race? Because you have people that sort of transcend pop culture, for example. You take someone that everyone talks about, like a LeBron James in Cleveland or Kanye West. I mean, do you think that people, I guess, in the celebrity spotlight, are helping shape perception for the positive? For the better? Not necessarily, but they are what they are. And that is not said with disrespect. Mm. It's what they've grown up with. It's what they're comfortable with. It's what they want to be doing when they're home on Saturday. They don't necessarily want to be in the backyard barbecuing a steak. They want to be out, uh, you know, uh, hip hopping. And doing, which is all perfectly fine. That's what they're comfortable with and they want to do. Uh, I don't particularly like hip hop music. It doesn't make me uh, anti African American. I don't like it. I don't like hearing that F word in every other line of a song. Mm -hmm. I, to this day, I cannot believe it. I'll be switching around a channel in the car and I hear things that I don't believe I'm hearing. And you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. This is what this is okay. what I well, want to do to that. Well, don't <laughs> don't don't put him on don't put him on Fox News now. <laughs> we don't have to say those words out loud. <laughs> yeah, I think we all know. I, th I think we all know. Um, There's a lot yeah. of stuff. I'm not going to use that word. Right. But you know, but but what I'm saying is, we're not used to that. And I know a lot of people in the African American community. They are not used to it, and they don't want to hear that. But how do you tell a teenager don't listen to? We listened to rock and roll when uh, the worst song on the radio, which they wouldn't play, was Annie Had a Baby, and he Can't Work No More. Do you remember that? No. That was a poem. <laughs> <Sorry. I'm 77. laughs> yeah, I, like, I do not remember that song. In the 1950s, that was a song you couldn't play. Annie Had a Baby, and he Can't Work No More. Work with me, Annie. <laughs> I mean, that was my father said, don't you play that crap in my house. You know, and, uh, and, and I knew when I played it, this was really bad stuff. Your dad, your where, dad sounds like a mensch. <laughs> your dad sounds like a real mensch. I don't know where Annie got the baby from, but I knew the song was bad stuff. Right, right. <laughs> Do you think that um, ultimately the focus in our country will be, hopefully, just about poverty, no matter who's the person who's poor? And that will focus on sort of lack of opportunity in all different types of communities, and that will propel us forward a little bit? Well, poverty always exacerbates a situation. You know, uh, if you're living up, uh, I, I, you live in Phoenix? Yes. You're living in, say, in Paradise Valley. You're living on Central Land. And uh, one of the Phoenix sons moves in next to who's African American, and buys a $3 million house. You and your kids are going to be very happy about that because he's sitting there on an equal plane financially and he's not a threat, whatever that word means in that context. But let somebody else move in the neighborhood who's black and maybe just barely making it, you're going to be unhappy. You don't want that for a neighbor. You may not want to have a white person in that condition in your neighborhood. And that's the bigot. That's when the bigot comes out. Mm. And, um, you know, you know one of the greatest lines ever spoken, and I'm trying to think if it was in the 20th century or 21st, is when that guy said, why can't we all just get along? Oh, right, there, was a guy, oh. there was a guy that had no formal schooling, 
uh, you know, who was a worker, he said one of the great lines of all time. I mean, you couldn't get a better line than that because it's the epitome of everything we'd like to see, correct? Why can't we all just get along? Wise words. <laughs> so Deborah asked a good question. What, what is your platform as president of the local NAACP chapter? What are your highest priorities right now? What are you, what are you up to? My highest priority right now is uh, I'm trying to raise money, which we're doing okay, uh, for college scholarships for the kids. Um, I want, we're fighting the prisons. I want no more prisons in the state. Uh, they're talking about a hundred million dollars for three private prisons. I'm going to tell you something. One billion dollars is going to be closer to the actual figure, maybe more, not a hundred million. And so I thought I started the expression. I may not have, but I thought I did. And that was educate, don't incarcerate. Let's put kids into schools. Let's teach them. Let's teach them to read and write. You know, let's be able to express themselves. My dad always said to me, learn how to express yourself. It's the most important asset you can have in this world is when you talk to somebody and they understand what you want. And uh, I think that's still a good, a good rule to live by. I have a question. When, how did you get involved with the NAACP, and can you kind of elaborate on your history with this organization? Yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, till I was about 14. We moved to Arizona, and uh, my folks were involved uh, with the NAACP in Brooklyn in 1941, I believe it was. And uh, one of the things I rue is the fact that, God, I wish my folks were alive. I'm 77. Obviously, they'd be 100 and something now. Uh, I wish my folks were, they'd be so proud of me. Mm. And I always did a lot of things in life because I knew it would make my folks feel good. I would just love to have my folks see me as president of the NAACP here. They would be so proud. And uh, that means a lot to me. I was, a, I was a Marine officer in Vietnam. I had black troops, white troops. I didn't have any issues with race in my outfit. My kids liked me, I liked my kids. And then your involvement with the NAACP over the years? I got involved here. Um, they kept me out for a few years. They wouldn't let me join. <laughs> no lie. I mean, I was being uh, segregated. And uh, finally, uh, George Logan, who was a judge here in the community and a friend of mine, he said, how come you're not involved with, uh, he said, I know you, you did civil rights work, you know, and, uh, People talk about it and everything, but how come you're not in the NAACP? I said, well, I tried to join, and number one, they never cashed my check. I never got my check back, and when I call about it, uh, I get the runaround. So I came down to the election when they were holding elections one year, and I walked up to Reverend Tillman. I said, I'm Donald Harris. He said, yeah, I know who you are. I said, why are you keeping me out? And he said, we're not keeping you. I said, yeah, you are. And by the way, I loved Reverend Tillman. I just think that he and I are very close. But at one point in time, I was not his favorite flavor. And he said, I'm not keeping you. I said, yeah, you are keeping me out. In any event, George Logan and several other black judges went and spoke to him. And some of the other officials, they said, Don's a good guy. Why isn't he involved? He said, you know, somebody's not telling the truth. He said he's tried to get involved and uh, nobody's listening. Well, they finally listened and let me in. And then I almost immediately became a member of the board of directors. And um, that's what I did for the last 12, 13 years. I was on the board of directors. I got the Lawyer of the Year Award four or five years ago. And uh, I helped out. I helped financially when, the, you know, the kitty got low. And it, it meant something for me. My daughter's active. She got me involved in now. Uh, She's in Chicago. Her and her husband live there. She's a public defender. So, you know, we've always been involved in, in what I call good causes. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Wow. Well, do you have any... Uh, I don't have any additional questions. Thank you so much for giving us all this time. I think we chatted for almost like a little more than 30 minutes. Wow. Yeah, it's really nice to talk to you. Thank you for asking. I, what I'd like to ask you is, it's so important people in our community, in every community, but since we're here, this is what I'll stick to, understand 
that civil rights is an ongoing thing. This isn't like, well, we've cured the illness and we don't have to worry about it anymore. We have to worry about it. And we have to have civil rights in the forefront. Why all of the TV and radio stations can't have a program once or twice a month and have people on from different areas of the community that deal with civil rights and let them talk about it and put it in the face of the community on a regular basis, a regular diet of, hey, we still have civil rights issues here. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. And uh, it would do so much more for the community. It really would. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. And getting you on Fox News Now is one of those ways to get these issues before a lot of people. And we really exactly. appreciate your time. Thanks exactly. so much. Thank, thank you for the opportunity, folks. You bet. All right. Take Have care. a nice Thanks, afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye.